Okay. Welcome back, everybody. It's time to start this new lecture. Um, today we are going to talk about the extended Kalman filter. You will see it's just a straightforward application of what we explained in uh, previous uh, lecture on Kalman filter. And we will also introduce a problem uh, that we described on the first lecture, which was localization, right? So in this case, you will find a clear motivation why we want to use filtering and just a good application for this. Also, just as a remark, in case that someone has uh, forgotten, today we have deadline for problem set one, right? So who has finished or is on the process? Okay, so who has not started? Okay, I guess people that have not started maybe are not here. Uh, but it's a good time to finish. I think, yeah, maybe, um, yeah, so those that um, are still doing things, it's close to be finished, you have like a question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so what I gave you was for a single task, a delay with no penalty. I didn't give you like seven days of delay, right? So try to finish today, right? Because maybe you will like, this is just a suggestion for those who are here. Maybe you want these days for problem set two or problem set three, right? Which are going to be a little more um, involved. So it's just one uh, assignment that you can deliver late. And then penalty, well, it's 15% each day, so that's something. Not a lot, but something. Okay, um, I think we can still discuss at the end of the course, right, which of the problem sets you want to take this discount discount penalty or whatever. But please, try to finish it today. Those that are here and are, are close to finish, submit it on the day, because then, if not, things are just going to be accumulating, and that's going to be worse. OK, yes, one another question. Why? Code filters. Ah, filters, yes, yes, yes. Um, so I think I'm advancing material. Maybe I will explain it today. But the reason is the following. So um, since you remember, um, when we defined the uh, base filter, right, uh, we were calculating belief of XT, right? And this was the, um, well, this. Right, and then we have second belief here introducing the observation. When we were defining about this, I remember that we uh, talk about Markovian properties, right? So uh, why, why is this important? Because if you have Markovian properties, um, you only care about the previous state. Right? So take a look. You only care about the previous state. So this is somehow you are filtering. Once you have the previous state, you have marginalized um, this distribution, this belief. This is the only thing you need. So you can think about this as a filtering process, where you just obtain your current um, state. You don't care about the previous ones. You just care about the, um, um, this command and the observation. And that's why it's called filtering. We are going to discuss what happens when actually you don't do this, but uh, you calculate, well, I'm not going to put it this way. Um, we calculate the joint probability from uh, start of time to the current time, right? And this will not be, this is a different kind of problem. Instead of being filtering, uh, we can call this a batch uh, estimation, right? Because we take the whole history. So that's a kind of different problem, right? But for introducing you to like the concept of Kalman filter 
um, base filter and now this problem on localization, I think it's a better approach to start talking about filtering. But you are right that this is not the only way of doing estimation. In fact, uh, batch uh, estimation is going to be much better for nonlinear systems. So we'll see that uh, this gives us like better solution. But this will be in three lectures or four lectures, right? But it's a good comment. Okay, so problem set one, do it. Problem set two, it's going to be released soon. Um, it's going to be about localization, so you will see all these uh, filtering in action. I think this is where you will get the insight actually on what it means to be filtering, what, what, what we are giving up the moment we filter and we just consider the past state, right, and not the whole history. So there's pros and cons. You will see this like in action in problem set two. About the final project, um, uh, we will do an announcement on Canvas, but now you should start, if I was saying on previous lectures to start looking at things to be doing the final project, um, today I'm going to ask you also to try to look for colleagues, right? So uh, by the end of next week, uh, well, I, I, I will announce this, this uh, on Canvas, but you should be proposing like teams teams of people, right? And, and then we will try to put everything together. And then uh, next step is once we have a team, each of you will propose like uh, a topic that you will be doing your final project, right? But the first step is look for three to five people. Um, less might be not, I mean, less than three might be not good, but um, okay, we can discuss, but ideally, yes, it's three to five. Okay, so, um, we have Telegram chat, we have TAs, we have, uh, you can contact us, maybe you say, look, we are a team of two people, we are looking for a third one or two other more, so uh, we can also be a hub for all of you, Try right, just to create the ideal number of team members. So we start looking for that, maybe on the break you talk, I don't know. Okay, so, so let's start then. Um, very briefly, what we discussed last lecture five, which by the way, I think it's going to be the record on longest lecture, so don't worry. <laughs> we discussed a lot of topics uh, yesterday. Um, well, the first one is um, we were basically, the, the, the class was more, uh, the lecture was more about um, all these motion models and, sens and sensor models, right? So then we start defining like the transition function, what it is, right? Do you remember? This is a discrete time model, but this actually was obtained uh, from a continuous time model, right? So if you remember, this is the transition equation. And at the end, well, this was a process for integrating like these continuous, uh, time continuous systems, but in our class, uh, this is just for you to know, right, where all these things come from. But we will just be using like discrete time systems, like the following, right, um, the following function, right? So it depends on the previous state, it depends on an action, and then we propagate the system. Right, so then we discussed a little about potential functions of this, for instance, two-dimensional point, that was easy, right, it was linear, and everything worked out well. And then we introduced like um, a very simple constraint, which is um, we have a pose in the plane, and we have a wheel, so that means that uh, we must satisfy like constraints of the wheel spinning on the same direction, it it's, uh, has its orientation. So that simply turned out to be nonlinear, right, but still, um, we, uh, what we can do is the same, linearized as we always do, right? So once we have this function, in general nonlinear, um, we simply decide where to add noise, right? Because we are not exempt of noise. If, if noise is not there, then uh, the covariance, um, the uncertainty propagation that we do will be a little um, problematic, right? Because it's just a linear dependency. But uh, we always add noise. We, we then decided, uh, we were discussing if it's on the action state uh, or, I uh, know, in the state space or in the action space. So if you remember, one was here and the other was here. There was a comment, what happens if you have noise in both uh, places, right? So you have noise in your actions that you're executing and, and this uh, transition function also has like noise 
it's fine. You can consider both, right? So then for these functions that were nonlinear, we were linearizing, and then what we were doing is uh, covariance transformation, right? So this is, um, well, it's a common theme that we have done here, but it's a simple technique, but very powerful to um, express all these uh, models, right? To be like now probabilistic models. And at the end, remember that uh, what we want is um, this kind of uh, motion model or if you want like a more uh, Bayesian definition, this will be a likelihood, right, of our uh, past state and our action, right? So we know that, um, well, after um, doing like, um, well, all these steps here, we kind of obtain a model, assuming a prior that is Gaussian, right, that was something like this. We were just evaluating uh, this function and then here we were just doing a, a covariance transformation. Remember that this GT is uh, Jacobian in case of nonlinear uh, functions or just the linear uh, term, right? And then we have this extra term that we are adding here. Where is this? I mean, this form is this on the action space, state space? State space, yes, yes, sure. Because remember, on the action space, then we need Jacobians for, um, well, for you, for the action. Okay, very good. So it was just a lot of content, but the idea, I think, was pretty clear. We were just giving a lot of examples. We were also giving um, references to the probabilistic robotics book. So if you want to take a look at the Jacobians exactly on how they are proposed and some of the models, they are there, right? So uh, on this book, actually, they are very well explained. You have lots of examples, figures. Um, when you will be doing problem set two, you might want to take a look there also, right? Although on the notes, uh, we wrote also all the Jacobians that you need. Okay, uh, what else? Then we talk about uh, rigid body transformations. Um, it's not something that we are gonna be using now but I think the idea is interesting. So um, if you remember, the problem was the following. We were just transforming a point, right? That uh, we want to be in the global coordinate. And then uh, we said that if we have a point that is observed in our local coordinate, actually there exists a transformation that uh, maps from these two uh, frames, right? So this is very helpful. We discuss exactly what is the structure of this matrix, but the idea is that it's, it's just a, um, a simple transformation. And what is more interesting is that actually this transformation, um, we can chain it with a sequence of other changes of references, or let's say that along, um, if you remember this, so this was A, this was B, and this is global, right? Well, the direction depends a little, right, because uh, the inverse um, will simply take you from the reference. I mean, if this is t, this will be t minus one, right, the inverse. But uh, we were saying that actually we can chain this transformation and still get the same, right? So these, these are gonna be unique. So in this case, uh, we can write it this way. So in this case, we'll have the intermediate reference frame A, right, and then we were transforming the same point. Okay, so this will be useful later, but this is another way of considering poses, right? It's not just X, Y, and our orientation into D, right? It's, it's also giving us like uh, all the parameters we need to transform any observation that we get from a local frame to the global frame and vice versa. Okay, so um, yes, this is, not, this is not the end, because then uh, we talk also about observation functions And in this case, if transition functions is a very diverse and broad uh, field where any system can be um, modelized, right, depending on the considerations you take. I think some of you were asking about second order methods, other about biases. It's, it's a lot of things that you can add into your model, right, just to make it more precise. For the observation functions, it's even more, right, because what we are doing here is processing um, sensor measurements 
And in this case, the um, variables are not so clear, right? So it could be pixels, in which case you have thousands of them, or you could be processing like some features from these pixels, or it could be all point clouds that we get from a um, range finder, right? So uh, in this case, what we said is that we are gonna start with a simple approach on the observation functions, and those are just features, right? So in this case, we define the term landmark, And then what we said is that landmarks are simply relevant features that have a fixed position, right? So um, in, in problem set two and problem set three, we are gonna be using landmarks a lot. You will see that we still need to do like, um, we'll need to introduce like a little term, uh, we'll do it today, but uh, with this, um, let's say that we can abstract a little the observations uh, from sensors, right? So for us now observations are like variables that we can define uh, on a more principled way, while uh, just sensor data, it's a little more uh, general and open, right? So with this, we'll have, just because we are now in 2D, um, the position of the landmark, X and Y. And well, uh, this is what I was saying, right? That now observations are gonna be more compact, so we'll decide, um, we discussed last day that um, actually we have a uh, an observation function, which is relating our state, and in this case now also the landmark, because this is a position, right? And, and what is the result of this? So instead of giving like all pixels in a camera, which that could be also an observation function, imagine set is just a, a stake, stack vector of all your pixels, so in this case uh, it's, the dimensionality of this is more reduced. Uh, we discussed that there's gonna be a range, there's gonna be a bearing, and then there's gonna be some signature, right, and signature, for now, um, think about it like as a description of this, we are not gonna, um, we are not gonna spend a lot of time now at the beginning. I think the important uh, thing for, for this um, definition was that there's this function, um, right, and then we are gonna have like, um, in this case, uh, this uh, relation between a state and observations. By the way, for problem set two, um, you will be solving a localization problem of a two-dimensional moving just with bearing. So imagine you are moving around, you observe a landmark uh, each at a time, and you are not really seeing like a range. So you don't know how far away it is. So uh, you just know the bearing. So with this, you will localize your system. Okay. So, and then what was the interesting thing after all doing, doing all this uh, observation model is that with this uh, we can define on our, our um, probabilistic model as always, this is what we care about, right? So if it's a function or another more complicated or less, that's not really so relevant. What matters is that uh, then um, Doing some assumptions, this is a strong one, but still um, it's important. If we have a Gaussian, uh, if our prior is Gaussian, uh, and then we linearize this function, we will still have like this distribution to be Gaussian. And this is, this is gonna be useful. If not, it, if it's any other distribution, then it's not so clear how we can use it. Still, we can use it, right, but I think then we'll need to change a little either the algorithm or well, some parts, maybe it's, well, but th that will be a little more advanced. I think once uh, we get the intuition here from this first approach of Gaussian, you could be doing like any other variant, right? So this is this, right? And as always, we evaluate things at the mean. This is gonna, I mean, the mean of the state, right? So this is gonna be the mean of the uh, observation. And then we are gonna have a covariance that, uh, well, you know how to obtain this. Okay, so that was it for this last class. Any comment? There's a video, I think, <laughs> two hours and 50 minutes. But um, maybe if you want to revisit like some parts, yeah, it's gonna be there. I think uh, on the, 
ideas that we presented, it was not that much, but there was a lot of comment because we were showing like different cases, right? For observations, for a motion model. So that's why, um, well, the content is large, but the idea is, is the same. We always get a probabilistic model. This is what we care. Okay. Yep. Yes, exactly. So the signature is going to be an identity or um, any other um, value that, has, that gives like um, a description of this landmark, right? It could be a 10-dimensional vector, right? Whatever features you calculate, it's, it's going to be up to you. But here we, we are going to discuss for this initial problem on localization, this signature, uh, we assume that it's going to be given. Right, so it's just going to be an association between observation and landmark. But if you have a more complicated signature, then it's going to help you decide, right, which is the right data association. The better signature you have, the better data association you will have later. Yep. Exactly. Mm, maybe in some minutes. Maybe after class. I'm not sure. Definitely. Tomorrow, he's asking about when problem set two is going to be available. <laughs> it's available. We just need to push it to GitHub. Okay, but anyway, you should be uh, here in class, <laughs> and then later play around with the problem set two. Yep. That's, that's a good question. So uh, he's asking if we should have a map uh, just to know where the landmarks are positioned. So the subtle thing is that there's no map. There's no map. That doesn't exist. So for us, what it's going to be a map is a sequence of landmarks and its positions in the same reference frame. Right? So this is the map for us. We have abstract any other physical meaning, and the map, it's going to be like Landmark here, landmark here, landmark here, and this is our map. Right? So it only matters that the three, the four landmarks are in the same reference frame. Right? So for localizing, with the functions that we have provided, all you need is this. These uh, positions in the same reference frame, and then uh, your observation function is going to give you an estimate of what you should be observing. Right? And with that, you will estimate your uh, state. So this actually opens the question of what is a map, right? But I think it's a good, yeah, it's a good comment. You will see this much more clearly in problem set two. Sometimes maps, um, we have like this intuition, right? Of just because we use them, like, I don't know, we see like footprints or we use like real maps or what that map should be or we open the mobile phone, but the map is nothing else that puts you in, in a global context, right? So you are basically extracting information from this global context, and what it is, it might be just these positions, and that's enough to know where you are. It might not be enough for a human, right? So this is useless. I give you these four landmarks with some signature. You cannot use it. But uh, for our case, yes, we'll see that actually we can do a very good uh, state estimation just with landmark positions. Okay, map. Set of landmarks. Okay. So then um, <clears throat> I'm going to rewrite again the equations for the Kalman filter, in this case for linear systems and Gaussian uh, to be prior. So um, this is just the same equations we already had, but I think it's going to be just a reminder. Right, so this is first equation. Second equation. And remember that this part corresponds to the prediction, 
right? So here, the only thing we are doing is propagating our system, right? There's no observation. We are just executing this command, right? So um, remember this from lecture four. And then we have the second part, right? Which is now uh, we have a Kalman gain. Yes. So I think you can also correct your notes because there there's a mistake. In case of doubt, I think <laughs> prevails what we say here in class, right? So th there's, there can be mistakes. That's something that you also need to be aware of. Okay, and well, here we have this equation, we have this cast, how to obtain this, how to remember this, well, I don't know how to do that. And then we had the um, correction step, right? So um, here, this, this is actually, it's very compact because now with this, I mean, all the matrices were just like uh, expressed with a single one, which is the Kalman gain. And then here, what we have is the innovation vector, right? And this innovation vector, actually, it's important. I mean, not really in the form, but uh, the meaning, right? And the meaning, it's basically how much our observation is deviating from what we should be observing, right? So al always think about it. If you are close to the mean, if this innovation vector is small, you are kind of okay, right? If this is big, if this is a large uh, value, that means that Either the observation is not matching or we have just obtained an outlier on the observation, right? But something is not wrong. And then basically the correction is gonna be like a little more um, abrupt than what it should be. Okay, and then we have number five, which is the covariance, right? So um, these are just as a reminder, uh, things that we obtain if the, if the system is, is linear, right? So Remember that A, B, and C are just uh, corresponding to a linear um, um, system and then linear observation function. But today's discussion, it's gonna be a little uh, different, right? So I already introduced, like in the title, that uh, we are gonna be talking about the extended Kalman filter. And basically, uh, the idea is, so extended in what sense, right? So it's basically uh, an algorithm that uh, handles nonlinear systems, right? Which are like um, common. It's not so easy to find a linear system. There's like examples, but it's not something that you will always find. Uh, but in reality, you need to make use like of this algorithm like in many other places, right? So the extended Kalman filter was a way just to approach the nonlinear um, systems like a little more, um, well, to approach nonlinear systems, let's say with an algorithm that it's known to be work, to work very well, this is the best thing we can do for linear system, but still, uh, how good does this perform in nonlinear system, right? So this is, was an important question like almost 50 years ago, and well, uh, the most straightforward thing, what would you do if you have a nonlinear system? Linearize, right? It looks trivial, but I think at that, po at that point, the Kalman filter was published, right, for linear systems, and I think they care more about the derivation of it. But then, um, it's, it was not straightforward until a nonlinear, um, this extended version of it uh, started like being popular, right, and used. So, if you put this in perspective, it's not like next day after publishing Kalman filter, someone proposed the extended one, but, um, Okay, so uh, let's try it again, the motion model. And basically uh, what we care about now is the, uh, the first order um, approximation. So um, in this case we have this, right? Uh, we have our function. It might look repetitive, but you will see that um, 
uh, when we put things together, right, it makes sense why we should be using just exactly this thing. So uh, we have this um, approximation evaluated at the mean. We have always argued that this is going to be our best linearization point, right? Remember, if you have a distribution, what is the best point for linearizing? Here, where we have like maximum probability, or here, like in one of the tails where nothing interesting happens. I would choose the mean, right? And I think so will you. Okay, so we have this, and then uh, we have derivatives. Uh, in this case, now, from the previous state. And well, uh, now we also have some noise. Okay, so we discussed this last day, exactly um, what is this, right? This is, this is a Jacobian, but the way to proceed was always the same for nonlinear functions. We linearize first order, so that means that we need the Jacobian. Uh, this Jacobian is also gonna be important in the extended Kalman filter, right? And, and the same happens for the uh, sensor model, right? So for the sensor model, um, we have this function. Um, here, um, well, let me write like noise that is also affecting um, this function, right? And it's the same, right? So we are just Okay, so we have this second Jacobian. Now I'm just gonna introduce like letters properly. So we have Jacobian of the transition function G, right, capital G, and Jacobian of the um, observation function H, right? And, and now um, that we have these Jacobians like fresh in our minds, we have presented it here. Um, let me show like a little example of what happens. Yes. This? Okay, sure. So I'm gonna plot like um, what happens if let's say we have the following uh, function, right? This is nonlinear, this is one dimensional uh, case and just to see a little uh, what we are giving up. So because at the end, it's not really the problem of um, understanding the extended Kamal filter. It's understanding what is exactly that we are giving up, right? What is the error exactly? Why uh, we should be careful on how we apply it? And I think this is the uh, first step. So we have this sort of function. Okay, let me redo it like this. Right, and now I'm gonna go down. So here, what we have is our prior. So you can imagine, uh, as I said, this is gonna be our mean, right? And this is the distribution of P of X. And then basically this nonlinear, if we were like doing the proper um, um, uncertainty propagation, right? We know that this is not gonna be Gaussian anymore, right? So I'm just gonna sketch a little how this will look like. Actually, the resulting Gaussian, or no, the resulting uh, distribution, right, of, um, right, imagine if I write here Y, and this is, um, um, P of Y, um, this, Function might be, um, so okay, we know that it's, it's unlikely, it's impossible that we have any, any um, I mean the value here on the distribution should be zero, right? So you can imagine here we have something like this and maybe there's like a mode and then we have another mode and then it goes like this, right? So this will be the proper nonlinear covariance propagation, which I'm sure you have done in many other courses in probability, random variables, etc. Now, uh, what we were saying is a little different, right? So uh, we were saying, in fact, we are gonna be linearizing, right? 
linearizing around here. And then basically after linearizing and having this point here, we are just going to have a Gaussian that is going to be centered here. So maybe it's something like this. So it kind of resembles the real uh, nonlinear uh, um, uncertainty propagation, right? But it's not exactly the same thing, right? Here, this is unimodal. We just have one mode. Um, so this is this is an important um, um, choice of design. When you are thinking exactly which kind of function you have, you need to be careful. Okay, if this is not, uh, if th this doesn't hold, if you if this kind of function is very nonlinear, and then here you cannot guarantee that this posterior will hold, will, you will still have like this distribution on, on your um, new random variable to be close to what it should be, then you should think carefully if this is the method that you want to use. At the end of the class, I'm going to give like an example of uh, an alternative for this distribution. I mean, for this, let's say, way of first order approximation of um, systems, right? But in general, uh, these functions are not that bad if we stay close to the mean, right? So if, if the error here with respect to the mean is not that large, and then we can still approximate them as, as um, Gaussians. But please, don't take, this is important, don't take this as always, what we do always is linearize and try it. First, it's, it's the most obvious thing, but it's not always the thing that you should be doing. You need to think. If then this nonlinearity actually it's affecting your distribution to be very, very different, you shouldn't be doing it, right? Okay, yes. So um, this blue distribution, this is supposed to be Gaussian. Right? Because I'm linearizing around this point, right? Which is the mean, around this mean. This black distribution would be kind of a sketch of what is the real uh, nonlinear uh, uncertainty propagation of this Gaussian distribution into something that is not Gaussian anymore. Right? So you put all the values here uh, in your range. This is the image. And then if you do the distribution of this, it's going to look not as a Gaussian. It's going to look as something else, right? So this is. This sketch is just to show this, that depends on the function that you have here, it might not look Gaussian. So is this a good approximation? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you're going to start like uh, getting um, estimates here and this is impossible for you and, and you really care about like uh, have an estimate that gives you um, things that are possible to happen, right? So here you are, I mean, there's a lot of error here. On, it's a high chance, right? That your estimation are here when actually you know that because of this nonlinearity, this is never going to happen. So this is just mismatch between nonlinear um, prop, um, propagation of a, a prior Gaussian and just linearizing and then having a, a Gaussian uh, transform. Okay. So what else? If we have these conditions, if we have like a nonlinearity that it's not that <laughs> um, terrible for us, and and still we have this distribution that resembles, right, um, the approximation and the real one, and for this you can do a sanity check, but it's not really required to be doing like um, proper uh, estimation. Then we can. Uh, um, we can apply what is um, finally the extended Kalman filter, right? So I'm just gonna uh, grab it here. Right? So um, we have the same inputs as before, right? We need, we need, uh, we need a prior, right? In this case, that's a mean and a covariance, we need uh, an action, and then we need an observation, right? So if we do it, um, if we want to apply now like a nonlinear function to the Kalman filter, this is how it will look like. So mean, it's just going to be the evaluation, as we said before, right, when we were doing the uh, expansion. Forget about the other expression. This is just evaluating this nonlinear function. Exactly at this point. 
Okay, what about the covariance? So the covariance, we are going to be using the Jacobian, right? We know um, how to do the transformation of the covariance, right, if the, this transformation is linear. So uh, again here, nothing new, but the important thing is that now uh, we have an estimation of this uh, distribution, and, and, and this is going to be Gaussian as well. What else? Kalman gain, I'm just substituting like all the Jacobians that we had before by the, uh, all the, let's say, matrices on the linear system by Jacobians. Right, so it's going to look like this. And then um, the update or correction with the observation, almost very, very close to the original Kalman filter, but just with some little um, changes, right? So the Kalman gain stays the same, but now the innovation vector is going to be slightly different, right? So we are just going to be using this. I'm pointing out which are the main differences, which are very subtle, but still they are like, they're important. Um, we are just going to be evaluating the nonlinear function here at the mean, right, at this one that we have calculated. And this is our innovation vector. And then the covariance, well, uh, nothing new here, just substituting um, Jacobians, and we have it. Okay, so conceptually this is not a big difference, we are still doing like the same equations as we defined before, but what has changed is that actually here we are applying a nonlinear function, right? It changes on the, on the sense that, um, and we will discuss about this, so what are the consequences of this? Each of these Jacobians have been evaluated at a mean, or let's say at a, a point, and this point will change over time. And this is bad because once you do marginalization, once you marginalize your previous variables around, uh, um, let's say, covariance that has been obtained with a Jacobian on a point that is no longer valid, there's no way to undo this kind of information, right? So that's why filtering is a little um, non-convenient if you have like big errors here in your nonlinearities. You cannot do undo. Um, you cannot undo. <laughs> um, um, covariances, uh, transformations. You cannot undo um, marginalizations, and the same happens for uh, conditioning. So this is an important thing. All these Jacobians that we are adding here are changing this, um, um, well, the Jacobians are changing the covariances, and there's not going to be a way for um, undoing this. But still, if the error is small, and we are like at a reasonable distance from this mean, this is, this is a very good approach that you can use, right? Just linearize and use the Kalman filter. Okay, any question? Yes, please ask. No, you don't accumulate error um, on the sense that uh, error is the difference between state estimation, ground truth, and, esti and, and estimation. I mean, and, uh, between um, state ground truth and estimation of the ground truth. The error is accumulated in a different way. And it's basically, um, let's say, a degeneracy that you accumulate in your covariances. So every time that you uh, calculate these covariances are going to be uh, slightly changed because the linearization points are changing. But it's not an error. It's just a degeneracy to the covariances. They are not going to be exactly the covariances that you should be seeing. So imagine you are expecting a Gaussian to be here, and the reality is that, no, you are not sure you have actually this, right? So this is the kind of error that I'm talking about, but not error on this state. No, well, we have here a contraction, right? So depending on the observation, it's going to decrease. And this is another, well, I'm advancing a little material here, but uh, the generacy actually it's going to come on this too optimistic decrease in your covariance, which is going to be bad. You might get even... Um, zero 
covariances, and this is the worst thing. If you, only ha if you always have like growing uh, covariances, well, this is a problem, but um, I would say that this only happens if you don't have observations, right? So this is the prediction step here. Yes, but problem set one, it's always prediction. I'm always giving you just the action commands. I'm never, gonna, I'm never, we are not giving any observation. But the moment that you have observations, your covariances should shrink, depending on the um, likelihood, right, of your model. But it's a good point. So just observation, I just commands, your uncertainty grows forever, right? So that's why we need observations. Okay, I'm gonna put it like this, observations, and again this thing. Okay, very good, yeah. So problem set, it's kind of the half a step. We are not really doing filtering, we are just doing like what happens with covariances when you do like some transformations and some things. But I hope that after that, everyone has like this insight, right, of oh, what is your state doing? How is it changing, right? And why do you need observations? This is a good one. Okay, so, Then let me talk a little about the properties. I think I have already discussed a lot, but uh, <laughs> let me just write them here. So EKF, it's still very efficient, right? Um, it has the same efficiency as the um, um, Kalman filter, right? So basically um, the complexity depends on a, inv no, 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 no depends on the inversion of the um, observation variables, right? So this is the dimensionality of set. Uh, and then, well, we do some multiplication and this depends on the uh, dimensionality of the state variables. So this is still quite good. Uh, there's also the overhead of linearizing, right? And evaluating functions, but this is kind of not, I mean, these terms will be dominating, right? Just linearization, it's very fast. Okay, what is the problem? I think this is not really a property, but more a problem, right? So this is not optimal. This is a good thing that we can do, but this is not the best thing we can do, right? And so far, we haven't discussed on optimality. I just said that Kalman filter is optimal. We obtain this from a, a Bayesian perspective, but then uh, what I said is that the optimization approach and the Bayesian approach are the same because Gaussians uh, have the same maximum, mode, and mean the, to be the same quantity. But for nonlinear things, that's not clear, right? So the maximum, it's not always gonna be the mode of your approximated Gaussian. It might be changing, and, and that's something not really, well, desirable. By the way, there's not an optimal solution for nonlinear systems, like the definite solution, your big hammer that is gonna solve all your problems. There's always gonna be trade-offs. So this is unfortunately or very fortunately for you because then you can do things. Yep. Yes. If you do map, um, this is an alternative derivation that I didn't do. If you do map of the joint probability of the um, motion, uh, well, after executing, well, yeah, the map of the joint probability of actions, observations in your state, this is equivalent to uh, just doing um, uh, Bayesian um, derivation of all your probabilities. You will get the same result. I think on the Barfoot book, there's a note on this. You can follow map. Yeah, and on the Probabilistic Robotics book, there's a derivation of map. So if you want, I think it's chapter two. If you go there, you will see the map. But I think this Bayesian approach is much more convenient. Okay, so this is not optimal, but in practice works well. So this will be like a tool for you to use, right? What is the first approach that you should be doing? Maybe start with this, right? If you have a state estimation problem, maybe the EKF is a good one. In Okay, so any question? Um, maybe I was a little pessimistic, but actually these are good news, right? This, <laughs> this filter works very well, 
right? This is the default uh, tool that you should be using, right? This is the first thing that you should be using if you need to solve this kind of problem. Start with DKF. And then you see if it's not enough, then you move to other more complicated things. But in practice, it's a good tool. So I'm just saying that don't take it that, yes, this is the only thing that you should be doing. But <clears throat> yeah, my message was optimistic. That's it. OK, so I mean, if not, why are we explaining this, right? If it's not a good tool. So everything we explained here, uh, it has some use. Don't worry for that. Now that uh, we have discussed a little what is the AKF, right? It's just like some minor modification of the uh, Kalman filter that we have derived. Um, I think we are ready to now start discussing a little on localization, right? So this is going to be a new problem. It's basically, uh, it can be solved many ways, right? But uh, we are going to be using like filtering because this is what we have explained. So uh, thing as localization as our first uh, real problem for um, our filtering techniques. Right? And, and basically, um, with all the definitions we gave last day, what, at, what our, 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 our observations, what our um, state variables, right? In this case, localization, it's just going to be the following problem. So, um, well, what is localization? Okay, so for this, what I'm going to be doing is uh, I'm going to write a graphical model, right? So here we have our past state. Here we have the state that we want to estimate. We have discussed that uh, for filtering, we will just be estimating this last um, state. Here we have some actions. And the same happens here, right? Remember that we are observing this. Um, okay, maybe I'm going to use like this color. This means that we are observing this, but we cannot observe the state variables, right? These are non observable. So we are observing these things. So then uh, basically, The um, localization problem, it's going to be just in, in following notation we calculated before. It's going to be calculating the belief of our current state. In this case, a state could be like a two-dimensional pose, right? Of our variable in problem set two, it's going to be a two-dimensional pose. That's position and um, orientation, right? And, and basically, we need, to infer, we need to do the best estimation, right? Uh, with the previous data that we have, th these are all the action commands, or um, and, oops, and these are all the observations, right? And I'm going to add here a new term, right? And you will see now in a moment what it is. So it's it's possible after what we define what to know how the system propagates. We have some observations, but we haven't discussed about the map, right? So how is, are these observations actually help us, right? So uh, this is where localization comes from. So what we have now, it's another um, variable. In this case here, uh, we also know this variable, right? So this map is known, or let's say that it's directly observed with zero uncertainty. And we have this, and then basically each of the observations um, each of the sets that we are obtaining here depend on this map, right? So this is going to be our, our relation. We are not going to be just calculating what is this state with some observations, but actually these observations have physical meaning, right? And in this case, we are observing like landmarks or, or um, features that have like a known position in a reference of frame. We will call this map, but actually, well, the definition of map in this class, it's going to be a little more general than what you understand by a map, right? So this is, this is the difference. The graphical model that we explained before, it has just been modified with this new uh, variable, which now it's given. But I'm now giving, giving you like some advanced hints that what happens when you don't know the map, 
So <laughs> this is going to be a problem, right? I mean, it's not really a problem. So we are going to estimate also the map, right? We are going to estimate jointly our state and the map. Okay, but for now, for this initial uh, problem, which is localization, map is given, right? And then we just want to know uh, what, what is our state. Examples of this problem have been around in humanity during thousands of years, right? So navigation, right, with boats, it's the same problem. You have like some known landmarks, like I don't know, like some mountain somewhere, and, and then you will just be calculating where you are depending on these known positions, right? So this is based on triangulation or um, other techniques. So this is a very old thing. Why do we care? Because um, now we are giving this a more proper treatment, right? So it's a Bayesian approach. This is a probabilistic model. Our observations are noisy. Our state is noisy. We have different sensors, right? And that means that we need better algorithms for solving this. But essentially, the problem of localization is very old. The same happens with the stars, right? If you know the position of stars, you can, um, well, um, calculate some of your state variables, not all of them for your localization, but at least some of them. Well, you can, all of them, if you have the right measurements. OK, never mind. This is not about ancient ways of navigating. This is about perception, right? So <laughs> for that. OK, so then the problem is clear, right? We'll have observations, we'll have actions, and the new thing that we are adding is that we have a known map. OK? OK, so um, then um, let me introduce what um, we'll be um, using as uh, Markov localization. Um, so basically, if our system is also Markovian, given this new map that we have, um, this is good news because then we can use the base filter, right? So, and I'm just gonna, well, you know the idea, right? So it's basically belief, and then we have a second belief. This is, um, I, okay, I'm gonna credit everything, but remember, uh, um, this belief with bar, it's just including action commands. And the belief, this is the full posterior considering the action commands and the observation. Okay, so this is a recursive thing. I mean, again, <laughs> repeating. A, I'm going to give you an example that is in the um, uh, probabilistic robotics book because this is also going to motivate a little exactly what kind of problems we are going to find here, right? And it has to be, it's related a little with this. So Markovian assumption is clear, right? Maybe our state only depends on the previous state. It doesn't depend on the previous one. But there's another thing that uh, we are giving for granted that that's not real always, right? And it's the thing that uh, over prior it's going to be Gaussian, right? So the problem with Gaussian is that we have, it's a unimodal distribution, right? So with this example, you'll see what happens when maybe we want to include like different modes, right? So what's going to happen in this case? It's going to be challenging, but um, so this example, it's very funny. They have a nice robot moving around, and there are three doors, right? This is our one-dimensional uh, world, and imagine that here we have our little robot moving in this one-dimensional world. It can only observe doors, right? So uh, these observations is just going to give you like where these doors are uh, located. Now, um, what is our prior um, um, distribution of states, right? So that is like saying what is um, our uh, belief of, let's say, x1. 
right? So let's say that at the beginning we don't know anything. So we can say that uh, we have like some distribution around each of the doors, right? This is, it could be any other prior distribution. But now we are changing a slightly the thing and you will allow me now just this to be a, a multivariate, no, um, a sum of Gaussians, right? For now, but. And then basically uh, we observe a door. Let's say that we see that there's a door in front of the robot like at five centimeters. And then basically this uh, is the likelihood of um, our um, observations, right? I'm putting here marks. But what is this thing saying exactly? That if we have like a door just in front of us, uh, th this means that for each, um, for each state, right, the distribution according to this should be something similar like this, right? So we still have like three Gaussians here, right? So the idea is we are seeing a door, but which one of these doors it is? We cannot really know, do we? They are the same. They have the same signature. If you if you allow me to recover like the previous um, set that we defined, right? The same doors are identical. And in this one-dimensional uh, world, with this prior, our robot cannot do anything. Okay. Um, so, but is it true? So it turns out that um, um, if we keep moving, right? If the um, robot keeps moving in this direction, eventually we might observe a second door, right? Or maybe not, we don't observe anything at all. So this will give us information, right? The map is giving us information, why? Because we know the positions of these doors, right? So this is just an example to justify that we still know something, although doors are exactly identical and with this there's no, I mean, if you calculate the uh, posterior of this, um, observing like a door and having this prior, we haven't improved anything. We are still like, we don't know anything, right? We are simply gonna get like, yeah, okay, so your covariances just get a little, you know, flatted. Here, this should be flatter. Um, you basically don't know much. You, you are not deciding anything. But we have a map. We know where all these doors are. And this is gonna be useful, right? So, we do this for um, some time, right? Yes. Here. Yes. 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 Yes, you do have a map, but your likelihood. I mean, the observation function cannot distinguish. Although you know where all these landmarks are, it doesn't matter because you can be anywhere, right? So if you're analyzing this on all your range of um, state values, you don't know where you are. This is, this is what you want. What, what you know is that if you are, let's say here, and you're observing the door as you are seeing, uh, this is likely because here there's a, a door. While the same thing happens here, right? The likelihood function here is telling you, okay, look, here there's no door, so this is very unlikely that's happening. It's still possible, but not likely. But you know the position of all, each of these uh, doors, right? Okay, you will, see, you will see in a moment exactly how this, this can help us. So we do this like for um, some, we propagate this several instants of time, let's say that, I don't know, H, right? And then here what we'll see is something like this, right? So we have our first distribution, second distribution, right? So all of them has just been flatter because we haven't observed anything at all. We haven't observed anything until we get here. And then here we observe another, um, Hold on, it's easy to plot with other colors. Um, so this is, this is where the robot should be seeing. And at this point, uh, we observe a, a new observation, right? Before we were not observing anything, but we have a new observation, right? And basically, after knowing the position of the observation and knowing um, the position of each of the doors, we'll have a similar likelihood function, right? So it's the same one as we had before. We have this, this. 
But now this is interesting because we have this prior, which is all these flatted Gaussians, okay? After these initial, we, uh, these initial um, conditions that we were like in any of the three doors. We couldn't say much about this. We propagate, we move to the right, like in this direction, and then each of them becomes less certain, right? Basically uncertainty, this is the problem that you were discussing, you just execute actions. You don't see any observation, right? So your covariances are just gonna grow. The uncertainty, uh, it's gonna grow. So, um, what happens? We observe one of them. And now, uh, this, is, this is where the localization problem, I mean, you will see on this illustration that this, this is actually gonna help us. So with this likelihood function in these um, priors, if we calculate for each of these Gaussians, we'll see that not all the uh, modes on this multivariate distribution are the same, right? So for instance here, the likelihood function is telling us that there's something but this something is multiplied by the tail of this distribution, the tail of this one, and so basically here there's like almost nothing, right? Why? Because our prior is telling us that here there was nothing. Yes. Why we are moving? Yeah, so um, if you remember, uh, this is usually the covariance that you have uh, when you propagate the system with no observations, right? It's a Jacobian, whatever it is, plus some random variable. If you do this n times, right? Imagine you have here this. For the second one, you are gonna have this multiplied by g, g, and then plus r. So basically you have a bunch of um, covariances that are being here added just because you have here this um, um, noise and basically this grows. It makes sense, you are just executing actions, you are never observing what's happening. Close your eyes and try to walk. You get lost, I get lost. Um, so this is the same problem, we are not seeing any observation, that's why these three modes here on, the, on this distribution that now you are allowing me not to be Gaussian, which is unimodal but just using the sum of Gaussians, each of these three hypotheses which is, yeah, you have observed a door, you must be in one of the doors, right? They are just flattening, because you are not saying anything, you are just moving. Yep. No, 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 no. So there's no observation. That means that our Kalman filter cannot execute the, four, the five equations. In your Kalman filter without, without observations, you can only execute first and second equations, which are executing the commands. So if you do that, your covariances grow. And this is uh, this comment that your colleague said before. Right? So on problem set one, you have seen that if you have a linear system, you execute actions, ex covariances grow and grow. Right? This is exercise three, exercise two, uh, three. Right? So this, this, this is the example. We don't have observations. That's why we have these kind of covariances. And this is important because any system that you use, doesn't matter how good it is. If you just, you just execute actions, eventually you are gonna get lost. Lost means you will not be certain uh, what is your estimation. This to this. Yes, so um, this belief is um, only for the commands. Yes, but you do this multiple times. And you don't do the second stage because you don't have observation. So if you want, you have a void um, likelihood function in your observation, which is not um, reducing the uncertainty. It's not doing anything. You don't have observations. So your filter, the only thing it can do is say, look, I'm just propagating. Covariances grows and that's why you get in this situation. Things are flatter so much that you don't know where you are. But, and with this, uh, we'll do a, a break later. Now you see a door, right? And this is your likelihood function of a door. So a door can be either here, here, or here, right? Three doors. Right, you see a door, you must be in one of these places and you know where they are because we have a map. Okay? Yeah, yeah, this is the map. 
these, these, uh, these are the locations of our doors in one dimensional uh, space. So we know that. Basically, this is the likelihood function that we will get, this uh, sensor model, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be saying that uh, anywhere that you are, if you analyze uh, what is the, this probability of being you there after observing that there's a door, it's going to look like this. So when you calculate now next belief, now, yes, adding the observation, this is conditioning. Um, Hold on. Okay, why don't you go away? So we set this mode here, since our prior is very uh, weak, there's not going to be anything. Here we'll have something that might have something, and then happens here, right? So basically, likelihood that you are here is very unlikely because you haven't, um, although you have observed a door, here there's no door, so it's not possible that you are here because there's no door. And the same happens here, right? So you still get like uh, a little signal, but not that much because the door is not really aligned with you, right? So you still get something like this. So this is how knowing the map helps, right? The observations are related to the map. This is how we are going to be changing. Now, um, we are going to do a break, but uh, you can have now in your mind that we were always discussing about unimodal distributions, right? So how can we still maintain like this idea of localizing? Sometimes you need to disambiguate, right? This visualizing, things that look the same, but they are not the same. How is this going to be affecting us, right? So I'm going to explain later, like a little the taxonomy of all these localization uh, problems, and then what we are going to do on this first approach to localization, right? Just to treat this like properly, still using um, Gaussians, which are unimodal, but still we are going to do a little trick such that these multimodal um, distributions will not appear. Okay, so let's do five minutes break. Okay. Let's get back to class. Um, we were discussing before, so what happens if we have like uh, any kind of distribution for this one-dimensional world, right, with doors. Um, let's talk a little more generally now about different um, localization problems, right? In this case, um, the example that we gave was like an example of a local localization, right? That means that what we are um, calculating here is a position, and basically we are tracking this position, so that's why we need filtering, right? Because uh, previous state, it's helping us to calculate the next state. There's this uh, sense of prior that actually helps, he will help us um, estimating, right? Um, this, what requires is to have the previous state, uh, an estimation of the previous state, so that means that the x0 should be given, right? We should have like some information or some um, at least distribution. There's a opposite kind of problem, which is global, right? And there are like two sub-problems here. Um, so the most obvious one is we don't have any information on the initial state. We could be anywhere, right? So that means that our prior, we need to think about it a little what it is. Maybe a prior with um, ridiculous amount of uncertainty, it's a good starting prior. This is equivalent to saying I don't know where I am. And then there's second uh, problem here on this global uh, localization, which is the kidnap problem, right? And basically what it is, is imagine that you have a evil agent just teleporting your system to any other position. So that means that your prior, it's no longer valid, right? You, you should be adding like, um, extra terms to your distribution because this can change. So um, what does it mean? It can teleport, right? In essence, it can teleport. So then you will be observing things, but your prior is not helping you, right? So it's basically you always need to solve the global problem. You always need to check, okay, where am I? Not just assuming that um, there was like this previous um, estimation, but maybe there's like someone that has um, 
change this, right? So this is more uh, randomness that we are adding. These kind of problems are strange, but still happen. So an example of the echidna problem is imagine you have a robot whose um, wheel simply doesn't work, right? So it's thinking that it's moving, but actually it's not. So it's equivalent to saying it's kidnap. Global uh, from not um, not having like initial estimate, it can always help. I mean, it, it can always happen, right? So you are simply not giving any information. And then basically you need to find uh, where you are because I don't know, maybe you don't know. You don't have the coordinates or, or you are not, you cannot calculate them and then start the algorithm. So you need the algorithm to localize also. Okay, so this is one of the biggest difference. Uh, now other differences are a little more subtle but still um, important, right? So uh, one is static versus dynamic, right? So imagine now we have a map that is moving and our features uh, or, or, or our landmarks are going to be changing, so uh, this can be problematic. We are going to mostly be interested in static, but by the way, this could happen. So every day we see like chairs change its position, <laughs> even walls, right, appear and disappear. So these kind of things are just dynamic events that are going to affect our localization. We as humans are very capable of recognizing these things and adapting, but for an algorithm, it's extremely complicated, right? Okay. What else? Um, there's a second thing um, uh, which can happen is that we have a localization system and then uh, we just observe things, right? So this will be a passive approach. But there's a second option, which then involves like uh, actions, and it's basically an active approach. Basically, um, this is related to the problem of exploration and also belief planning. It is what is the next action that you have to do uh, such that you will localize yourself like uh, with um, better probability, right? Or, or whatever loss function you want to define. So this is a different problem. It's uh, now we are including actions, and this will depend a little on the um, system that you have, so not all of them, not all systems are good for um, executing actions. I would say that robots, this is the only thing they do, right? They can execute actions, but imagine if you have a mobile phone and then you want to localize, maybe you cannot move, right? So it's gonna be a little more passive. Or maybe you can say the, mo the telephone put some arrows and that's kind of your action but that's a little strange. Still, the difference between uh, passive and active. In problem set two, this is gonna be just passive localization. I'm gonna give you uh, data, right? And with this data, you will localize, so you don't have any control on the actions that you are executing, but this simply opens like a new dimension to this problem. So it's good for you to know for the future. Okay, and then, uh, well, uh, there's also like the problem of a single robot, right, or single, uh, let's say, um, system or, or sensor and then multi-robot, right, but um, you can imagine that uh, then what you need to do is fuse all the estimations from each of the single robots properly in a multi-robot frame, or this could be the same robot in, or the same sensor in different sessions, right, so you have one session, you stop recording, you start the second one, but you don't know the, the relation between sessions, right? So this is another example of a multi-session or multi-robot uh, localization, single robot versus. And well, and then you can imagine any kind of combination that you can think of, right? Like dynamic, multi, active, can get complicated. Now, uh, what are we going to do? We are going to start with the first approach, which is uh, uh, local, local um, localization, right? So um, there's not going to be this problem of we don't know initially where we are. There's not going to be a kidnap that it's going to teleport our robot. Um, landmarks are going to be static, and then we are just going to be executing like uh, whatever actions this stream of data is giving us, right? But the problem can uh, become a little more involved if you start like considering like all these things. So it always happens in real life. But um, for problem set two, let's say that we start with this canonical definition of uh, localization. Now, after all this discussion on 
localization and all these things. I think we are ready now to define the uh, EKF localization. And in order for this to work well, um, as we discussed, right, with the three doors and this uncertainty, we need to um, do a little, um, we need to do, we need to add an extra term that you will see in a moment what it is. So, as I said, what is the main problem here? That Gaussians are unimodal, right? Okay, so getting back to the example of the three doors, this solution is um, we are going to define an extra variable that it's going to be the association, right? And in this case, uh, we are going to call this C, right? And for each, um, for each observation, right? So Z is all this Z of observations. It's going to be assigned a landmark directly, right? And then uh, this is our map. This is a set of all landmarks. Right, so we'll see that we actually need this. So this is what we call data association, right? Either if we estimate this or if it's given, uh, we need this. Why? Because now that we know that uh, which is the association for each of the observations that we see, for instance, it will be, oh, okay. So um, now instead of observing any door, we are observing door number two, right? So with this, we'll have a unimodal distribution, which we can, um, assume that it's Gaussian, right? There's no multimodality, which was actually hurting us in the previous example. So it's just a single one. And the price to pay is that we have this extra variable, right? But we'll see what uh, we can do. Okay, so uh, this problem is basically called uh, known correspondences. But there's going to be a lecture exactly on this, right, which is going to be when we don't have known correspondences, then we need to solve the data association problem, right? So I'm going to introduce you also to this problem, which is still nowadays like a serious problem, right? So you have a bunch of landmarks, maybe not three doors, right? But imagine you have thousands of key points and then how to differentiate one against the other, right? So we'll see that it's not so trivial problem and it's still relevant. You have a question or you are thinking on asking a question? Exactly. Why? Because we have known correspondences. So we know that for this observation, let's call this observation I, this uh, is assigned uh, only door two, right? So this is what I'm seeing here, that this C variable, what is giving is the index um, this C variable is for each observation, right? We are going to have the index of the landmark, right? So this is solving, this is the, I mean, the correspondence then is known. No, wait, wait, wait. Um, so if you need this, um, this to be before, right? You need this before. If you solve, uh, then it's called a joint problem. You will be uh, calculating this, right? You will be calculating jointly what are your state variables jointly with the all data association, right? And this problem, it's a little more complicated. What I'm saying now is that um, if not, but for now, don't worry about this. If this is known, then uh, what we can write, it's basically, um, okay, so this will be like uh, posterior, but we can write is that we have an observation, right, that will depend on our state, will depend on the map, and now it will depend on this variable that is the association, right? So I'm just adding like um, extra terms here. Okay, I'm gonna delete this. Yep. Okay, so, I'm going to give like a second example. So in this case, the Dorf's case will be, okay, you have a new observation. 
It's not just that, but you also have the ID known. So let's say that your signature is perfect. You have a um, covariance zero on what is your signature, and then it's giving you exactly which, to which landmark the observation corresponds, right? So that's why these things are basically like just the tail of your uh, distribution. There's not another mode here. Okay, is this clear? This is a trick that we need to do. We need unimodal distributions. This is the only strong requirement, right? And in localization, this is gonna be like really an issue, associating uh, observations and landmarks. Is this clear? Like any question, doors are good. I'm gonna draw another thing now, not doors. Yeah, say please. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. This is a help to the localization problem. The localization problem, it's gonna be estimating your state with respect to all the observations that you have and all the uh, actions that you have executed. And not just that, but in addition, you have a map, right? So with respect to the map, the observations that you have, this is the localization problem, this belief. The new thing is this with respect to previous Bayesian um, filtering. We have a map, we know a map, we know the exact position of each of the doors. Now, this could be any kind of distribution. Every time that you see an observation, it could be any of the doors. This is what I was saying in this problem at the beginning, right? So the motivation is you see a door, but which door it is in one dimensional world, right? How can you know if you assume that you don't have this information? If you have that, then basically multi-modes will appear. And this is bad because you cannot apply then base filter or the Kalman, no, base filter yes, but you cannot apply the Kalman filter or the extended Kalman filter as we have explained. We need this strong prior. So imagine the other way around, forget about localization. What we need in order to apply a Kalman filter or extended Kalman filter in this, uh, for this problem is to have Gaussian distributions, unimodal mostly, right? So we are enforcing this uh, this way. And a way of solving this is saying, okay, so correspondences are known. But this is another random variable, right? That later we will jointly estimate if you want. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, but, yeah, yeah, no, 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 I'm not gonna introduce that for now. So these are not random variables today. As I'm introducing them now, they are just known correspondences. A uh, deterministic uh, value that is giving you this information that this observation belongs to this landmark. Later, we'll see exactly how these distributions look like, right? But for now, let's assume that this is just a deterministic uh, value, right? It's known, it's, there's no noise, it's no error. Exactly, observation I belongs to Janmark J. Okay, this is important. So any other comment? Okay, I'm gonna plot now the two-dimensional thing. Why, because uh, this is gonna be a little more similar to what we described that our, model, our observation uh, function was, right? So remember, uh, we were using uh, range and bearing, and you will see in a moment what is this in this context, right? So here you are in your little robot. This is the orientation, right? So imagine now, uh, let's say that we see Z This is observation one, right? So for observation one, we have a range, right? This is telling us like how far it is. We have also a bearing. Right? Um, the same will be true for number two and number three. So I'm just gonna plot here this thing again. R3, this is phi three. And then now let me talk about the different uh, observations that we have, right? Because we want at the end to um, um, 
use the full observation uh, model, not just single observations, right? So here we have a set of observations. And then for this, uh, what we have to do is uh, do the following approximation. So we assume that um, um, these three observations, okay, here I go, I'm gonna add a second one. So this is set two, this is set three. So, but we want this, and, and remember that set is just the set of, right, three observations. It could be just one observation. It will change, right? In problem set one, it's just gonna be one all the time. But if you have several of them, then uh, what we need to do is like some assumption, and in this case, it's gonna be independence, right? So um, each of these observations is independent from the other, right? So basically, in this particular case of the three landmarks, uh, this is gonna be the product of each of these three terms, right? And I'm gonna... Um, Okay, I think there's like some mismatch on the, um, um, notes, but basically here it's a uh, subindex i, right, for each of the observations. So this is great because the joint distribution, we don't know if we have, th if we have three of them, but for each of them, yes, we can just provide a, a observation model. We have described it in past lecture, right? So we have our state, we have our map, Map is position, right? And then we have this correspondence. So for this observation, we know that this corresponds to MJ, whatever it is, right? So this will give us like exactly this. So we have um, X, here we have M. So with this, you can calculate a range and then you calculate a bearing, right? So the, the, the function was very simple. It's just, you have two positions, well, one pose and one position, and then it's just calculating like how far away it is, it's, that's a distance, and the angle between um, the two of them. Okay, so if we do that, then uh, does everybody agree that uh, we can still use like, I mean, the observation function is what we explained yesterday. This is a unimodal Gaussian distribution. The only difference is that now we have a product of them, right? But still, this is, this is a valid observation uh, model. We have a distribution with respect to the state, a map, and then these C variables, which is gonna be like the known data associations, right? Okay, so we kind of solve the, <laughs> um, this, I mean, we kind of enforce Gaussians again, just by adding this trick. Later, as I discussed, this is gonna be a random variable, but for now, let's assume that we have this divine intervention saying, yeah, this observation is gonna be this landmark, right? Okay, so then things are a little easier, just a little, and then uh, I'm gonna now describe a little the algorithm of the EKF localization with known correspondences. Right, so this is EKF Okay, um, by the way, this is in probabilistic robotics um, uh, page 204, right? If you want to take a look later at the equations, the good thing about this book that is really amazing is that they present an algorithm, right? They put all the equations, all the formulas, and then they go one by one saying, okay, so uh, this equation number three, this is where it comes from. Uh, there's like an explanation, right? As if they were sitting with you and explaining this to you. So if you want to go over this reading, especially, I don't know, for these selected um, parts that I'm writing here on notes, I think all of you are like welcome. Still, with uh, material that we have in class should be enough, but I'm sure that when you start doing problem set two, maybe you want like an extra uh, support. So that's why this book is, is very good at. Okay, so, oops. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, I thought I got lost. So, um, what are the inputs, right? We know that uh, we, knew we need a, a prior to be Gaussian, right? So that means that uh, we basically need a mean and a covariance, right, of our previous estimate. Remember that here, what we are estimating here, uh, xt is a, a pose in 2D, right? But uh, the localization could be like in 3D, could be in any other kind of um, coordinates that you decide, right? It's simply um, easier just to start with localization in 2D, and for that, uh, we need two dimensional poses. Okay, so this is our prior. Uh, we are gonna execute an action. We are gonna observe a observation, right? And these are the new things. So we are gonna have a map. Right, so we must know the location of all these landmarks. And then we are gonna, we need also, um, for each instant of time, these correspondences between all the observations and landmarks that they correspond to. Right, so this is part of the input. For now, um, let's say that these two things are kind of new things that we're introducing to the um, uh, EKF algorithm. Okay, so, I'm gonna write all the equations. You have them on your notes. Maybe you want to apply, you want to write like some comments on each of them, but it's the same thing again, right? So it's the Kalman filter, now the extended Kalman filter, that I'm gonna ex explain like the, all the, these particularities, right, of the localization problem. I have already described the general, the general idea, which is data association and then, um, um, well, this, uh, let's say, product of Gaussians on the observations for multiple of them. But other than that, it should be straightforward. Just in case, uh, let's go over the um, derivation, right? So the first thing is we need to calculate the Jacobian. Um, you have this in another page of probabilistic robotics. You have this in previous lecture. You will execute this. You will implement this in um, next problem set. We also need the Jacobian uh, with respect to um, actions. Right? Um, and then uh, what they propose in this book is like uh, uh, covariance, right? that it's not gonna be constant. We already discussed a little on this uh, yesterday on the um, covariance that we apply to, um, to the point, I believe, that was like considering uh, not just like a constant value, like let's say identity with some scaling, but actually this depended on the velocities, right? So uh, they tried this for the, um, well, a little more yeah, by the way, no, no, no. This is, this is an important thing. Probabilistic robotics on this page, it's explaining for a motion model which is kind, uh, which is called arc sear. It's, it's a variant of what we explained. So imagine, this is, this is similar to the EUNI cycle, but with, um, so it's closer to a second order uh, motion model. I'm not asking you to implement this. So I'm gonna ask you to implement the um, odometry model, right, which is what we discussed the other day. So that's why they are using here like some covariances that are a little different, but still, um, it doesn't matter. Once you have like a function here and then you calculate the Jacobians, all the steps on the algorithm are the same. Okay, so in this case, just to illustrate that yes, um, they are proposing like this kind of covariance. It was something like this. So in this case, you have a translational velocity. You have an angular velocity. And then cross terms were zero, right? So uh, this was kind of the covariance that they were proposing. It's, it's supposed to be independent, right? So remember that, um, well, here M, by the way, is action in the, I, it's noise in the action space, so uh, this corresponds to V and this corresponds to omega. But this kind of covariance is what? It's independent, 
B and W are independent, but then the magnitude on the covariance depend on both terms, right? On how fast you are, that's more unlikely. Uh, how much you are turning on, it's also going to be like more covariance. Yes, please. This is covariance, yes. Uh, before we were using for this the uh, term R, but in the book they use M. And it's because usually R is in the um, state space. This is just a nomenclature, but, and this is in the action space. Yeah. Okay, so on problem set, we will describe like which is the covariance that uh, you want to use. But still, um, think that uh, this can be anything you want to estimate. Yes. What is B? Here. So um, we discussed that this is going to be a, a kind of unicycle model. Right, so in this case, u it's gonna be b and w, b or omega. B is the translational velocity, o omega is the um, rotational velocity. But keep in mind that what I'm gonna ask you to do is for the unicycle model, right, which has here rotation one, delta of translation, and delta of rotation two, right. So this is gonna be your action. This is for MROP. I'm just saying that here, if you go to this page, don't be confused because they explain this for the uh, another model. But for the problem set, I'm going to ask you to uh, implement the um, odometry model. Okay, so then you will need to use just the proper Jacobians. And then uh, this, you can imagine, right? So here you have three state variables. This covariance should be three by three. But this is just an example of, of uh, what a covariance might look like. You might use like a uh, constant. On the instructions, it's um, clear which covariance you can use, right? Actually, this affects, but uh, it's not really, I mean, you have freedom of choice for this covariance. Okay, so um, now um, I'm just gonna write like known equation, right? These were like things that we need, but this is the first known equation, the um, uh, estimation just executing the action. Same as we did for the EKF, so there's nothing new here. This is the first equation of the EKF. Um, then what is the covariance here? The same thing, we need the Jacobian. And then here, this is the only difference that uh, they are like differentiating. Before I was using R prime, but actually they are using like M, right? So um, <clears throat> this is what? Like noise in the action space, but we know that this is equivalent um, just to a random variable that could be exp explained in the state space as well, right? So um, this R was like appearing before. Now you just need to multiply it by the proper Jacobian because, well, you need to transform it a little. Okay, and this is um, second equation, right, on the Kalman filter, nothing new here. No, nothing new. Okay, there's a question? No. Okay, uh, then uh, because yeah, they detail everything like a lot. Um, in this case, the <clears throat> observations that they have are like um, just this. You will have like parameters for each of these for range and, and bearing. But keep in mind that for problem set two, uh, QT is just gonna be like, um, you are just gonna have one observation. I mean, your, your observation has dimension one. It's just the bearing. So you will just see the angle, right? But um, it's because, I don't know, or, or <laughs> for, for make this a little more interesting, uh, we were just like reducing the information you have, but you are still, um, you will get like very good localization just with bearing information. 
Okay, but I'm just following this, like in the general case for localization, you will have a bunch of ranges and bearings, right, with these covariances, and then the problem it's gonna be like uh, calculating, um, well, calculating this posterior, the um, correction or the conditioning, right, after including all the observations. Another note here is that the, uh, this is the signature, right? Since this is known correspondences, you can assume that this is zero, right? So effectively, we are eliminating this. Right, we don't need a signature. It's already given. We know exactly which, co which uh, landmark is uh, which one, right? Okay, so uh, then here starts like the little difference we need to iterate, and uh, it's gonna be an interesting discussion, right? So we have several observations, right? In this case, uh, um, we said that uh, each of these observations, right, were a little different. For me, uh, for now, let's just follow the uh, nomenclature in, I mean, let's just follow that the observations are range and bearing, right? So that's what I'm writing this way. Way. Okay, so we have all these, I mean, we have all these indexes, right? I don't know, in, this, in the previous case, we had three observations, right? So we'll need to go, we'll have like three uh, measurements on frames and bearing. And then the question is, how can we update um, the Kalman filter with three different observations? And it turns out to be like easier than what it seems. Um, I'm gonna put now, I'm gonna just write the, the equation, but um, it's gonna be simplified because we have assumed that these observations are independent, right? And if they're independent, you'll see that uh, very simple things happen. So here we have, um, okay, I'm gonna write full thing. So we have the um, landmark J, X, minus mu d of x, what's up? Is it funny? You want me to write it or you want me to skip it? No, I just want to Oh, whoa, whoa, which part? Okay, I'm just writing now the nonlinear function. I'm just writing this thing. Right? I'm just, just, just for you to have. And then we have uh, each uh, observation, it's gonna be a little different. But this is just the uh, function that is relating a state and observation. Yes? This. This. Ah, this is square root. No, action, no, 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 action is gone. M, this is M. No, no, no. M is the landmark, right? So M stands for map. Right? U stands for action. Actually, this comes from Russian, right? So U, I mean, what is action in Russian? Okay, never mind. I don't know the word, but. <laughs> but typically from controls, right? Uh, when they talk about actions, they use the n letter U because. Okay, so that's, that's the. <laughs> If not, there's another approach for this and you can just write A, which is actions, which is a little more used in AI, but these are actions. And then mean, this is mean. <laughs> Why am I using mean? Because uh, this depends on the state. Right, so here what I'm doing is just calculating the most expectable observation that we should be observing. In this case, is, um, we have here a landmark, 
we are here, this is our XT, and it just happens that um, um, we calculated with respect to the mean, right? So uh, you know, well. So range, it's gonna be this distance, right? And bearing, I'm gonna write now what it is. But here I'm just writing distance from landmark to position, right? This? Yes. Yes, this is the mean of the state. This is the mean of the state after executing action U. So we have executed action U. We have done first steps of the Kalman filter. We know what is this belief just considering the action. Not the observation yet, just the action. This is our best estimate of where we are now without observing anything, just executing. And with this, we need to calculate what is this distance to the um, landmark, right? And then the bearing, right? So distance is this. Um, right? Nothing crazy here. And then uh, we just need to calculate. I'm just going to write again. Atan, right? But you know that this is just regular arc tangent, knowing the quadrant that you are in. Right, so this is delta of y's, and this is delta of x. Okay, so that's it. For problem set two, you will just be using this. There's no distance. So this is the observation. I'm just applying this function. Okay, so we have a bunch of them. I of them. Right, and then uh, basically what we need to calculate later is the Jacobian for each of them. It's going to be different. Yes. Yes. Oh. Okay. You're writing. Yeah, there's a thing that it's going to be helpful here. So I'm just going to write this. I'm just going to queue, going to go call Q all the. Um, these terms inside the uh, square root, right? So you will see that this appears later in the uh, Jacobian. Okay, so, so far, we are not doing any strange thing. We are just estimating which is the most expected observations that we should be seeing if we are like exactly here, right? In the uh, um, mean just knowing the action. So this is what we should be seeing. Now what we see is different, right? So we need to process that correctly. Now let me write uh, what is this. This is the um, Jacobian of the observation function. And take a look that now depends on the observation, right? So why is that? Why depends on the observation if uh, we are linearizing around the mean. So you are close, you are close. Um, it's not really a high level explanation. It's something even more simple than that. You are talking about landmarks. What we said is that we have known correspondences. So this function only works if we have the correspondence, right? So that's why it's going to be different for each of them. Because if you linearize this, and then you linearize this, right? It's going to depend on the landmark that we have. It's going to be different for each of the landmarks. Um, so maybe some Jacobians are going to be similar, but this is just a coincidence because you are seeing the same landmark. Uh, what it's going to make the difference is that when you linearize, you have like different landmarks. So this function is going to be different for each landmark. Okay? You see it here, right? So there's dependencies on this. Um, there's not really much that we can do, but it's fine. We, we just linearize, recalculate things, and if we have a closed form, this should be very, very fast. Okay, and then... Uh, well, oops, um, here there's like a derivation for this, right, which uh, the probabilistic robotics 
book gives, right? I'm just going to write, so it depends on something like this, like the difference of the um, uh, landmark and position, and then it's going to be divided by this square of Q, and then here we have other terms, and then here for the arc tangent, we also have like something that depends on Q, right? And then finally, because these observations are, um, I mean here, uh, remember that uh, we derive with respect to X, we derive with respect to Y, and we derive with respect to theta, right? So the final row, it's, it's gonna be very simple. It's just one minus one. Yeah, actually, yeah, it's like this. I'm here for getting like one term. So please take a look at the notes because there all the terms are correct, right? For this, uh, for taking a look at the Jacobians, you only care when you start like implementing. But, um, well, I'm not gonna credit everything. Important thing, we have different Jacobians, right? Because there's different landmarks. So, uh, now what it comes, uh, they'll, they'll use this intermediate uh, variable, right? Uh, which is gonna be used this way. So this is, this is kind of, uh, well, this matrix, we know that later we will we'll use this for the Kalman gain. And take a note that we, we are all the time just writing this super index, right? So this is for each observation, right? And then you will see in a moment uh, what's, the, what's the difference between um, different observations, how we can fuse all of them, because at the end that's what we want, right? We have different observations, each of them is telling us something, what to do, right? Now we don't know, but you'll see, you'll see in a moment. Okay, so we have Kalman gain for each of them, again. Now uh, we have this, this is not different, Jacobian for this guy. Okay. This? This is Q, Q of T. Remember Q is, what? So Q is the covariance for the noise that we add in the observation function. So, um, when we were defining H function, we were always saying that, oh, but there's gonna be some noise that we add here. Okay, and now let me write it this way, right? Um, if you remember, equation from the Kalman filter should be calculating the um, um, mu without this bar, but I'm just gonna do this, and then I'm gonna write this on a recursive way. So this basically means that uh, this is the previous mu of t that we have calculated, right? The, on the first iteration before um, evaluating any of the observations, this is uh, what we got from just um, marginalizing the command, right? And the, on the next uh, iterations, it's gonna be different, but the good thing is that there's an iterative way of calculating this, right? So we have this. Uh, this is just the Kalman gain for each of the observations. So this is the mean, right, what we should be seeing, right? And then the covariance is gonna be the same. I'm just gonna do this, right? So remember, this is kind of abuse of notation, this is not correct, but um, we are just updating this variable, right, with whatever was before, and for the covariance is the same, right? So we are using um, fourth and fifth equations of the Kalman gain. And I'm gonna give now like explanations of why we can do this, right? So what we are doing is, uh, we update this with this new information vector. We have a new uh, mean. And then for the next iteration, let's say for the second observation that we see, we have here a different one, a different uh, mean, right? It has changed. And the only thing we do is just apply again the Kalman filter multiplied by this innovation vector. So we do this iteratively, we just do a summation. And still doing this, like imagine, um, I'm gonna expand this, but uh, you can say that here we are sum summing all these things for each of the variables, right? So we have here a summation. Um, this is uh, the best way that we can do. And, and we are conditioning against all observations. 
Okay, well, let me finish and then you will see this a little more clear. Right? So this is it. The uh, four ends here, right? And then um, this is more for formal things. Yeah, this will be our final min, whatever we got after correcting. So we are correcting n times. We are correcting for each observation, we are doing this correction, right, or this conditioning. And then the covariance, it's gonna be the same. So we just update whatever was the last uh, correction we got. Okay, so uh, this is what I was saying. So we could also be writing it this way. This is the previous one, right? And then what we do here, it's a summation of this Kalman uh, ga Kalman gains for each of the uh, observations, right? And then here, um, so we are just applying here superposition. Yes. Yes. But all of them are real, right? So the idea behind is that each of them is giving you a little information, right? Each of you is just contracting or reducing the uncertainty that you have here. Right, so it's kind of giving more certainty on what is your state estimate. So you want to use as many as possible. All of them are real. All of them are valid, right, if, if the model holds. But then the surprising thing is that you can condition against multiple variables and the result is gonna be like this. So instead, before, forget about this summation, what we had is that the um, conditioning was just taking into account like this mu bar and then doing this sum and that's it. But still, this is valid. We are conditioning against all of them, right? And this is the um, um, distribution that we get at the end. This is our belief, right? And what we are doing is doing a summation. So I'm gonna show now why this is possible. And then we'll leave. <laughs> okay, why? Why this? sum equals multiple uh, conditionings. Yes. No, 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 so this equation in brackets, uh, this is what happens when you do it this way. You can do this incrementally or you can put it like this, the summation of all of them. This. But they, Yes, 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 yes. Yes. That's right. So it should change, right? Why are we not taking that into account? And I'm going to explain it now that actually, yes, we do. Yes. <laughs> This is a very good point, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna answer all of this. Just to sum up, when you do this conditioning and you do this incrementally, it's true that then your covariance has changed. So that, that means that we should be using another, not this covariance that is here, but actually the one, I mean, this covariance, actually that has been changed, right? So that's what you are saying that you cannot write it this way. But I'm gonna show you now that yes, right? So. Yes. So, 
So what we are doing is I times, we are updating or conditioning. Right? So this is clear. And it's true that we then need to update not just the mean, but the covariance, right? So what, how is it possible that we have this summation of things and still um, works, right? And, and remember that we did the following assumption, right? Each of the observations is independent. So that means if you're observing one landmark, that's independent of observing the other landmark. You cannot really observe the same landmark. I mean, that will be, that will be very strange, observing the same landmark in the same instant of time. You typically, you observe it again, like in, in other instant of time, right? So, but still, uh, th that's not a requirement to observe different ones. It, it's a requirement to be, them to be independent, right? So if that is true, uh, let me write the belief of XT on the following way, right? Because this is at the end uh, what we are doing. We have these observations that depend on the state, depend on the map, and now depend on these correspondences. And we have the belief bar, which is only considering actions, right? So far I haven't done anything um, strange. Just, well, there's here a normalization factor, but it's still fine. Now, what we said is that this set of observations are independent, so that means that this um, observation model, or likelihood, if you prefer, actually um, just, um, it's a product of individual uh, observations, right, in the following way. And then we have a belief here. Right? And, Okay, so far everybody agrees. Yes? Thumbs up? If you don't agree? No? No agree? <laughs> okay, more or less. That was a mild agreement. So let's continue. I'm just gonna expand this. Let's say that uh, for some indexes, right? So by induction, I'm just gonna show that, yes, you have here your first observation, right? Then we have a product with respect to the second observation. And this simply goes on until we get to the um, i-th observation, right? So this is the same um, products here, but simply like putting like all indexes, all, all terms. And then finally, what we have here is belief of fixity, right? So um, we discussed that Imagine, forget about the, all, the previous, all the previous terms, we just do the conditioning of the last observation, right? If we do it, we know that this is a joint distribution, right? So, this is conditioning a joint Gaussian. Right, so here, if we come, um, we are gonna get something that it's still uh, multiplying like this product now with a, a one term less, right? And <clears throat> yes, one term less on these probabilities that we have here for the observations, and then we'll have a Gaussian here, right? So this is gonna be our condition Gaussian. What is the form of this Gaussian that we are conditioning? Well, we know that here, what we should be doing is subtracting um, from the mean. Okay, I think I can write it here. So let me write it like uh, this. Um, it's gonna be the previous one. Um, well, some matrix, and then here we have this uh, innovation vector, right, on observation, right? So this is gonna be the new mean, right? So if we do this, the mean here, it's gonna be this, right? And the covariance, we know that it, um, it's gonna be the sure complement, right? So it's the previous covariance minus like some terms that are cross terms, right? We got this, this distribution. Now, if we do it for the following one, we are gonna have the same thing. But now, um, if you see in the recursive form, uh, we are gonna have this minus k, let's say, this is for i. So we'll have the same for i minus one, and then the innovation 
uh, vector. And the same happens for the, um, for the covariance. Just because Z. Yes. Yes. But still, if you see the, the relation that you get after the definition of the conditioning was always like we were subtracting, like a term, and then it was just a sure complement, right? We, where we were reducing like part of it on this covariance. So if you do this incrementally, you will, I mean, if you do this by induction, you will see that um, at the end, all this, it's nothing else but a summation of all these terms. So that's why we can put like things like this. It doesn't depend. Um, um, so we don't need the order, it's going to matter, but for a different reason, right? But uh, if we do it this, this way, you will see that at the end, uh, the covariance is going to be the same. It's going to be this covariance, uh, this is a summation, right, of all the covariances, right, which are the sure complement. So at the end, uh, this is going to be the result. Our previous covariance is going to be just subtracted a little term that we add, right? And, and then we have, well, if you prefer here, all the cross terms. So just by the definition of the conditioning, right, where our covariance was just subtracted by a, a cross term multiplied by the one that we were removing, and the mean was just the same thing, just removing a little part or just changing it, if you do this iteratively, at the end, uh, you will get just a summation of all of them. Why? Because they are independent, right? So what we have here is cross terms zero. So you can do it this way, and then you don't need to update this uh, new joint uh, covariance to be very different. So do this exercise as an example, if you want, right? So condition the last one, and then you start doing, and then you will see that at the end, uh, what you get is a summation, same as we are putting here, right? So although this looks a little strange, right, that you can come here and just, just do this incremental summation, and the same happens for the covariance here, actually, Remember that this is a contracted form after uh, doing like some manipulations for the Kalman filter. But what's going on, it's a conditioning, right? And the conditioning is just the previous covariance, I mean, your block covariance on that variable minus some uh, terms that you are subtracting. And that's, um, that basically, um, it's just a sum of terms, right? If you do multiple times. Okay, so now your question, wait, wait, wait. So this is important because you were mentioning about the order. From what I have explained, the order doesn't matter. But, what? Because independence. But there's a big uh, little and subtle thing. It depends here, because every time we have a new linearization point and you want to be as close as possible to the real estimate. Right? And this is why it's important, right? So you don't start with your worst estimate. You start with your best one. You have better linearization point, and then the others are going to be adding you more information, more accurate information, right? In terms of just the pure definition of the conditioning of multiple, um, um, conditioning multiple times, that's, that's not a difference, right? It's just a summation. But for linearization, it matters, right? So, um, um, yeah, one question. Here. So this will be the joint approach. You just come here and do this big summation. What is the problem of doing this? That linearization point, if you allow me, I'm just going to create here this. Linearization point for all these Jacobians that are inside of this case is the same. And that's bad, because you want to be as close as possible. We have discussed a lot about the error. So this is what matters. It's, it's a very subtle detail, but it's very important. So why you do this incrementally? Because every time you are linearizing better, closer to your estimate. If you start with this approach, yeah, let's do it like jointly. Then what will happen? This derivation will have like a couple less lines, but then you will be introducing more error. Because remember that the error actually depends on, on, on how, far you are away, how, how far away you are from um, the linearization point, right? No, 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 this is, this is a different problem. You just move once, and then you receive two observations, of three observations, or whatever. 
And then the, the question is how to process them, all these observations. All of them are helping you. You need to use all of them. What I have explained from the Kalman filter before is that you have one observation, right? But what, what is one observation? It might be like a concatenation of all observations. The, the subtility here is that you don't process all of them together at the same time. So although this is equivalent, it matters the order. Be I mean, no, 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 no. Um, if you don't update, it's not moving. It's updating your estimate, which is this. If you don't uh, update your estimate and then you are linearizing always from a estimation that might be far away from uh, your actual distribution, because I don't know, your observations are very far away, right? So then you are gonna be doing more error in this um, Jacobians on H, right? So this is just gonna be propagating. This error is gonna be affecting you. So what I'm saying is that use the most dress and observation, no, update them, and then for calculating the next conditioning, you are using the newest information, right? The newest uh, linearization point. And this is, this is the only subtility. So why you need to do this on a kind of uh, loop instead of just coming here, which, which we said, we have demonstrated. I mean, you can do it later home that you can come here and do this summation for your mu, and then the covariances is still the same. You are gonna get like a summation here, right? So here you have a summation, it, it's gonna be the same. But linearization point, it's gonna be just the initial one. It might be a bad one. Okay, okay, so that was it. Um, with this, now you are ready to start problem set two. Please finish problem set one. I talk a, a lot about problem set two. It's really cool. You will see, you will see things moving. You will see things um, being estimated. We'll have like a version maybe later. Oh, we have it. Um, but um, the bad thing is that it requires time. So if you have spent time on problem set one, problem set two, you will need also a little time a little more than problem set one. Okay, so finish problem set one, ask any questions you have, you had, um, and start problem set two as soon as you can, like tomorrow or in five minutes when you uh, submit your next, uh, uh, well, problem set one, right? But yeah, start soon. Okay, thank you, see you next week. <laughs>